Hi. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us, everyone, and, and welcome to Belfast Photo. Uh, I'm really happy to be kicking it off with a wonderful group of, of women. Um, I know everyone must be a little bit zoomed out, but it's going to be good. OK, um, I'm just going to I'm going to start by kind of setting the scene for why we're here and what we're kind of going to be, be talking about. Um, I don't think structural gender inequality is a is a new concept to anyone. But for the record, for those who don't know, around 80 percent of photography graduates are women and yet women make up 15 percent of professional photographers. Um, over 75% of commercial photographers represented by the leading agents are men. Um, men earn on average 40% more than their female counterparts as photographers. Um, and I could go on and on, but the world is depressing enough already. Um, I like the crux of it, right, is that that it goes so much deeper than just fairness and equal opportunity because kind of taking a photograph is this explicit act of, of power, right? Um, photographs don't just show us things, they, they tell us how to see the world. So when representations of people and, and culture, let's say of, of womanhood or of the female body or of femininity, when these representations are so overwhelmingly constructed by men, it's not just that they define us, but they kind of teach us how to to perceive and, and understand ourselves. Um, and there's kind of immense potency that, that photography holds. It can be hugely liberating in, in the right hands, but it can be really damaging in the wrong ones. Um, but kind of all of that said, we're, we're in the midst of this kind of pivotal moment, right? Socially and culturally, where the internet and social media have really democratized the art world in this unprecedented way so that that women and and other marginalized people have more control over their cultural representations than ever before um it kind of the internet and, and social media are allowing women to kind of bypass these archaic male networks on which galleries and media companies and kind of publishers are built because these networks aren't the only way to get your work out into the world anymore. You know, so I think of like Dana Scruggs, the first black person to shoot a Rolling Stone cover. She made her name from internet crowdfunding, her own magazine, because she couldn't get any work. Um, or I think of like an obvious example is Juno Calypso, who's kind of infinitely Instagrammable work has elevated her to one of the most sought after for photographers today. Um, so in terms of tonight and to kind of kick off the festival, um, we're gonna unpack some, some big questions. We're gonna, we're gonna look at how far women have come in art and photography um, and how far they've yet to go. We're gonna ask what does the female gaze really mean and how are kind of new generations of female photographers changing the medium and changing culture and changing how we view women. Um, and on a kind of more practical level, what do we need to do to keep this momentum going, right? To ensure that all this lip service around empowering women and other marginalized artists, how does that kind of translate to, to real palpable change? Oh, it's a lot. Um, but so I'm going to introduce you to everyone. Um, joining me this evening, we have Nidia Blass. So Nidia, Nidia is a multidisciplinary artist. Um, her work explores sexuality and intimacy and her lived experience as a girl and a woman and a mother. Um, Nidia is also professor of art and visual culture at Spelman which is a prestigious all black women's school uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, in the US. Hi, Nidia. Hello. <laughs> um, and then on the commercial and editorial side of things, we have Holly McGlynn. 
Here she is. <laughs> um, Holly is an award-winning fashion photographer. Her client list includes Chanel, Levi's, um, Tiffany, Mulberry, and she also teaches fashion photography at Central St. Martins in London. Hello, Holly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last but not least, we have Gia Macondo Wills. Hello, Gia. Hi. Um, Gia is a documentary photographer. Um, her work focuses on race and colonization and the Western gaze and how that all kind of ties into identity. Um, he has been exhibited and published all over the world. Um, and she's often listed as one of the brightest emerging photographers to be watching out for at the moment. Hello, Gia. Um, Hi. <laughs> it's so nice to have you all here. Um, I'm gonna shut up for a bit now. <laughs> Um, I kind of want to, I want to open the conversation by looking at sort of recent history and um, thinking, I guess like it's 2020, right? I mean, feminism has been trendy for 10 years or so. Well, certainly white feminism has. Um, and particularly in the kind of last five years, we've had a, in photography and visual art, we've had all kinds of initiatives and, and collectives and awards to kind of advance women, right? And, and promote their work. We've also had a lot of panels to be fair. <laughs> Here's another one. Um, but I think let's start by like looking at where we are and kind of what has or hasn't shifted in this period. Holly, I wanna start with you on the kind of commercial editorial side of things. You've been in the industry 12 years. Um, I guess I want to ask, have you, have you kind of noticed a, a palpable change? And if so, what has that looked like for you? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's hard to like be objective about that in the first place, because as a photographer, you're kind of an island anyway. Like, it, well, if you're a self-employed photographer, unless, you know, unless you work as sort of um, at a big company, like an e-commerce team or something, uh, you're working with other photographers, but as a self-employed photographer, you're kind of working on your own. So it's really hard to sort of compare experiences. Like if I'm on set, I'm working with a stylist, an assistant, a makeup artist, but there's no other photographer. So even kind of meeting other photographers to compare your experiences with is quite difficult. Um, so I'd say I've kind of only made photographer friends really in the past um, five years or so. And I guess from talking to them, my male photographer friends, uh, when we've sort of drilled things down, I've been like, oh yeah, actually your journey has been easier uh, mm -hmm. than mine. Um, and, uh, but I do think sort of over the past few years, uh, like something that really like made me furious uh, when I was starting out was like going through the magazines that I wanted to shoot for and every single photographer's name I would see would be male. Mm. Uh, and I just couldn't wrap my head around why like magazines, like female editors of women's magazines uh, that have photo shoots uh, with female models were commissioning men to take photos. Right. Um, just couldn't kind of get my head around that. But now when I look, um, at magazines I'm seeing lots more uh, female names as the photographers which is heartening but only five years ago I like I was just trying to think of some like examples um throughout my career I was contacted by a brand um to do a shoot for them and it was to do like the packaging for like worldwide distribution on their product uh and they um said you oh we don't have budget uh but would you be up for this <laughs> are you mad oh, that's so <laughs> that's a really big celebrity as well and I was like the celebrity is getting paid you're going to make money off this product why on earth would you not pay the photographer as well mm. uh, and they said okay fine yeah give us a quote so I went back with a quote for them and like considering it was for like a global distribution like it was a fairly modest quote and they said they yeah they said no we're going to go another way and then I saw that um they had commissioned a photographer a man of course uh, and I wrote to them and asked for feedback and said oh I see you went with this other photographer do you have any feedback for me um, and they said yeah well it's just that 
uh, your quote is really high and um, I only had a budget of a thousand pounds. And I was like, if you had a thousand pounds, why on earth did you ask me to do it for free? Uh, and I bet that they didn't ask uh, that male photographer to do it for free yeah. in the first place anyway. So um, yeah, that was only as recent as five years ago and I'm sure it's still happening now. Mm. But yeah, I don't, I'm seeing more female photographers, but whether or not they're being paid the same as men, <laughs> it's very hard to figure that out unless you have um, friends in the industry who are photographers as well. Yeah, and can I point to the importance of kind of like mentoring and support when you're at, in the early stages of your career, right? Like how valid that can be. Yes, definitely. And transparency as well. I think people are always very cagey about what their fees are. Um, but I think, yeah, just having a bit more transparency about uh, what you charge uh, and why. Um, and more education on sort of uh, image licensing and things like that. Like that's something I just sort of figured out myself. Uh, but I think that should be taught, um, you know, as one of the key subjects when you're um, teaching photography as well. Mm. You touched a bit on kind of internalised patriarchy that women manifest, right? Because they're, they're, they're in women in, in publishing are hiring men to shoot things. And, and you said to me before that you feel you've kind of, part of you has internalised a male gaze in parts of your career. Yeah. right and you've kind of had to unlearn these things yeah for sure yeah um because one of my favorite photographers uh is ellen von unworth um, mm. yes oh my God. i love her so much but i was looking at her photos recently i was like oh my god that is internalized male gaze of oh, this is ellen von unworth hugely and I, I feel so conflicted about it yeah <laughs> so, do I, so do i and i have one of her well a print of one of her pictures in my bathroom um my son my three-year-old son was looking at the other day and I was like oh god I really don't feel like this is appropriate mm -hmm. actually for you to be looking at at all so it's a tricky one because I do love her work but um yeah I do definitely think that's an internalized male uh gaze um so yeah it's a little yeah. bit of a tricky one I think like when we've all been kind of conditioned within a certain culture right mm -hmm. constructing an alternative one devoid of a male gaze is really hard mm. but I guess like just being honest about about past practices and kind of ways maybe we've all been complicit in these systems is just super important because yeah, it all comes back to, to accountability right and I think like yes largely that needs to come from men but it also needs to come from I mean specifically white women really like massively um Nidia <laughs> are you muted are you on no, not anymore <laughs> um i was gonna say the kind of the start of of your photography journey was maybe more difficult than than some people's and i wanted to ask you kind of when you were studying and and aspiring did it feel like you were choosing a disruptive path um, I think uh, it probably felt like I was choosing an irresponsible path. <laughs> um, I, uh, when I chose to return to school, I wasn't studying photography at first, but I had two young children. Um, and I had studied photography since probably about seventh grade middle school. Um, but as I returned to college as an adult and as a parent, I thought that it was like ridiculous. Like I can't study art. What am I going to do with this? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but then I received a camera as a gift and I went on a trip. And after that, I was just like, okay, like I have to do photography. This is like what I'm supposed to do. But I think I felt um, I don't think it was so much disruptive at that time. I think it was just irresponsible. Like I have kids that I have to take care of. What am I ever going to do with photography? And how am I really ever going to take care of myself um, and my children? But I think it was that little voice that I just listened to and went down that that path anyways. Yeah, that's yeah. great. You've, you've said to me in an interview before that you kind of found yourself making work that maybe your white male professors weren't so comfortable with. Yes, that uh, totally happened. And I think um, it's funny because I wonder if they like read that now. <laughs> like in the, in, you like, think? <laughs> well, like, if they do, I'm good. Like, <laughs> talking about me. Um, but yeah, just being uncomfortable with certain work that I was working on. And I remember for my thesis show for undergrad, like kind of having this back and forth of, like about like maybe something is too heavy or do I have the right to comment on something concerning Black folks specifically, um, which I most definitely feel like I have. Uh, 
in terms of my uh, background and my family and where I came from. So um, yeah, so just that notion too, I think also that believing in yourself and pushing forward with something that like you believe in or you understand that even if somebody doesn't at the time, um, I think of like the girls who spun gold, um, this project that I worked on with a group of girls is I don't know if there's anything that exists exactly quite like it. And I didn't even understand it at the time, but just to know how important it, it is. Mm. And I guess people seeing that work now, I mean, that is one of my favorite projects ever. And um, we'll, I'll show some pictures of it, of it later, but I think that project in particular is, is such a kind of powerful example of, of helping young girls and women kind of learn to see and, and understand and perceive themselves right um yeah we'll i'll show some pictures from that later um gia are you with us do you hello there she is um yeah i mean kind of similar question like you so you're a lot earlier on in your kind of career um when did you graduate oh, graduated my MA in I don't get this wrong it feels like the past two years three years of merging yeah well, recently well, right so you're I mean yeah you're, you're 2018 no 2019 no it couldn't have been last year <laughs> year before recently be. right recently recently very recently <laughs> um, no, but, and I think that's that's great like I'm I'm fascinated to know kind of your I guess like your experience of of studying and aspiring and kind of breaking through to to documentary photography and how it kind of compares um in what way kind of how it how it came about or, or well you know, like you've told me before that um when you were at uni, you felt like you were kind of not represented in the rest of your class. Um, Sorry, I missed that. There was a delay in the, in the- Oh, that's okay. No, I was just saying, you've told me before that when you were kind of at uni, you found you weren't so, you didn't see yourself represented in, in kind of your classmates, right? Yeah, I think it's definitely, um, I think it was a, it was a process, I think. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in the UK, so I kind of, I knew what it was going to be like, but I think it was definitely, um, it was difficult to feel like you're representative of kind of multiple people when you're kind of there just learning. And I was really adamant that I, Oddly, you know, at first I, I didn't want to make work around race. I didn't want to make work around my experience um, because I didn't want to be pigeonholed, you know. And I didn't. I didn't, I was I, that I was so adamant. And you know, was my my was my tutors that encouraged me to go down that path because that's where I I I my I I articulated myself best. Um, but it was definitely difficult. And I think also in our institutions, you do sometimes. You know, it's easy to feel like you are when you're making a project around race or if you're making a project around the complexities of identity uh, especially if you're in a very white environment you're having to explain a whole social political construct plus the history that comes with it plus the personal experience that comes with it on top of your aesthetic mm. of the work or the motivations behind you know your pros your, your your making process so i think that's sometimes difficult when you have all of that loaded stuff behind Find you and you kind of just want to make work and it can affect you and um, it can definitely weigh on you. It does teach you to, to um, but yeah, I think that was, that was difficult to not really have a lot of people to, you know, obviously uh, someone who's an educator, if they can't speak from there, if they can't speak from experience or they don't understand you from experience there's only a certain level in which right. it can um they can kind of help you at, if that makes sense mm. but um yeah I think that I don't know if that explains yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> and I think that last point is completely right I was listening to um Shaniqua Jarvis on a podcast the other day and she was saying when you're kind of starting out 
as as a young black photographer finding mentors that kind of that relate to the journey you're going to have is difficult because there just aren't enough people in the industry um oh yeah definitely not um yeah. and I've been very lucky to have some great people to to mentor me but also I think that there's this kind of assumption that oh they're a black photographer you're a black photographer therefore you know you know and obviously you do have that you have that kind of kinship and you have that unity um but you know they might not you they might not be able to help you in the sense of your, you know your career path or mm -hmm. or your subject matter or whatever so because there's not enough kind of um yeah there's not enough there hasn't been enough kind of mix up of the industry to mm. be able to provide you know lots of um mentors you know one high profile black photographer can't mentor you know 20 emerging graduates you know they can't they can't do that no. um it's a lot of responsibility dumped on very small people a small amount of people so yeah and i think your your earlier point about kind of pigeonholing is is so important for the industry mm. that to recognize right now because I like I guess the problem exists because most of what we've seen is is whiteness equated to universality right which mm -hmm. gives white people the privilege of telling whatever stories they want um mm -hmm. which infers that what like blackness only speaks to blackness and I, yeah. I, I hope that that what we'll start to see more of it as kind of more photographers like you emerge is that a different perception of universality I guess one where it's kind of like uh it's a given that that black photographers and women photographers get to get paid to make work that goes beyond their immediate community or experience or, or light right and that's kind of when like all the the kind of shows of diversity and inclusion will actually be authentic if you see what I mean mm -hmm. yeah um I want to kind of talk to you all a bit about what the female gaze really means. Um, what does it kind of mean to, to frame the world through a woman's eyes and, and how does the female perspective sort of change um, the way we see? And as I do this, I'm going to get your pictures up on screen. So this is some of Holly's fab work. Um, Holly, in terms of the kind of the the representation of women in in photography and history and stuff, mass media and and advertising has played a huge role in disempowering us, right? And kind of selling us lies about how we should look and you know how we can be more palatable to society and what we need to buy and to make that happen. Um, and I think it was kind of in the 90s that, that photography started to be recognized as, as this more malicious tool, right, to sell us these lies. Um, I wonder, do you kind of, do you think a lot about these things when kind of shooting women as a woman in the advertising world? Do you, are you kind of conscious of a, a responsibility to subvert these paradigms of male power? yeah definitely and like we were discussing earlier like um it's the sort of paradigms of male power are something that i've sort of had to unlearn as i've gone throughout um my career uh because i like for a certain uh, sort of, uh stage of my career like i was just so sort of like hungry to succeed that i was just doing what has always sort of been done in advertising and editorial and then i reached a point where i was like hang on why why am I only shooting white women? Hang on, why are they all like 17 years old? Um, so yeah, I had to sort of say, okay, well, no, I need to like cast more diversely. Like as a photographer, you have an awful lot of power as a commercial photographer, certainly in terms of like the rep people that you're representing in your shoots. Um, so yeah, I think even if you're just getting like um, a package of models, so uh, a modeling agency will send you like a package, which is sort of like maybe 10 models that they have available for a shoot, like uh, pushing back if they've only sent you models that are like really young, white, blonde. Um, like asking your client if you can have a say in who is cast um, and if they say no and they, 
cast like a 17 year old uh, who, who's white and blonde, like ask why, say, can we not see something, uh, some more diversity uh, in our shoot? And I think it's just like about constantly sort of like pushing back, mm. uh, not just um, in front of the lens either, like behind the lens, like having a diverse team as well. Um, that's really important because even if you have um, a black model, if like the entire team is white, then we're pro just projecting our biases uh, in that shoot as well. Um, so, so yeah, I do, do try and like, I think, yeah, it's really important for photographers, um, especially white photographers, to try and push back um, as mm. much as possible. Uh, and then there's retouching as well. Um, uh, I think for a large part of my career, I was I was just sort of doing what I saw. So like I was retouching my model so that their skin was completely flawless. Like even which I'm so embarrassed by now, but like slimming models down, um, mm -hmm. and for no reason other than it was the done thing. Um, so a few years ago, I was like, why on earth am I slimming this model down? And so I made a decision uh, to immediately never do that again, uh, and then. And then it sort of, I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to smooth out model skins anymore. Um, uh, yeah, so just sort of making, I've had to unlearn a lot. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's important to, to unlearn these things and kind of have these uncomfortable conversations, right? So that you can acknowledge where you've been complicit because, you know, we've all done it um, for sure. Um, we can't, like, we've, you and I have discussed before, um, Emily Ratajkowski's recent essay, The Model, um, who kind of came out with a with an essay about image ownership and kind of exploitation by the by the fashion and modeling industries, which a lot of people might be familiar with. Is that is that essay something that kind of really hit home for you? Oh God, yeah, I was I was very affected by that essay. I couldn't stop thinking about it for days afterwards. Um, yeah i mean and there was a lot to unpack in that essay i mean it was obviously the point she was making was about um models being entitled to copyright over images that contain them but also it was a story of abuse uh within the fashion industry as well and um yeah something that a, a huge sort of uh norm in uh the industry is for um models to uh do like a go see which is where they go and meet a photographer, have a couple of headshots taken, and then uh, see, it's sort of a bit of a chemistry test as well to see if you would want to cast them in any future shoots. But um, I mean, a lot of models who are starting out, first of all, are like 15. Uh, so they're children, um, essentially. Uh, and they're, they're sent like all over the country to strangers' houses. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a practice that really, really needs to be reviewed and fast and actually a couple of modeling agencies who I've worked with recently when I've been organizing go sees have said oh we don't um send models to photographers houses if you want to do a go see you can come to our studio here mm. uh, I, I think the industry definitely needs to change uh in that way um but also uh like believing models uh when they say you know this photographer was a little bit creepy mm. uh, or this photographer um the, uh, assaulted me, um, believing the models, um, but also like empowering uh, models to speak up as well um, and know that they will be believed. And mm -hmm. actually that's something that I wanted to say earlier uh, is on set, um, I always try and empower my crew to speak up if they see something that doesn't look right. So uh, even like the runners, um, to if you see like inappropriate behavior, please like say something about it. And if you don't feel like you can confront someone, then say it to me and I'll confront them mm -hmm. about it as well. But also- um, I think that's I so important. That. Um, yeah, because yeah. I've, like, I've been on sets before where I felt deeply uncomfortable and, and if someone had said to me, you can say something that's yeah. really uncomfortable and, you know, we want you to do that, it would have really helped me at the time. Yeah, they're handing you the power um, yeah. to do something about it and that's something I feel really strongly about. Mm -hmm. um, but al also in Emrata's um, essay, uh, 
what happened to her was that um, this horrible photographer who assaulted her um, had all of these nude photos of her that he took without consent because he got her drunk in order to take the photos uh, and now is profiting from an exhibition and a book of her um, naked image and copyright law very much sits on the side of the photographer well certainly in the UK um, and I don't think that's right at all I don't mm -hmm. think um, anyone should be able to uh, take images without your consent and be able to profit off them. No it's a, I think what's interesting about this kind of new age of photography is how the nude genre is kind of transforming a little bit um, because like I'm obsessed with the female form and I've always felt a little bit conflicted because nude photography is, is so obviously populated by female subjects shot by men right which is why it's been so tied to kind of gratuitousness and um, exploitation but I think what we're starting to see is, as photography and as society opens up to women and kind of non-white people and non-Western people and queer people, people are kind of reclaiming the need and kind of opening up this, this idea of the body as like a site of political potency and of, of pleasure and possibility, which I love. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna come on to, oh, Gia, you're back. We lost you there for a second. Um, Gia, have we got you? My internet's awful. Yes, my internet's terrible. I don't know what's going on. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to kind of ask you, I guess with regard to, to the, the white male gaze across documentary photography, oh, we've got some of your images. Sorry, I've got, um, here, we, here you are. Um, this is a project, one of Gia's projects called They Came From the Water While the World, while the world Watched. When's the book out, Gia? Oh, she's frozen. Sorry, we missed that. It should be this month. Amazing, how exciting. Um, yeah. I was just going to ask you, um, I guess with regard to, yeah, to the white male gaze across, across documentary photography and, and I guess photojournalism as well which as genres have this huge history of, of you know, being tied to colonialism. Mm. I think there's this refrain from, from some white male photographers that you still hear where they kind of say photographs of this nature are objective, right? Um, they're just kind of shooting what they see in front of them, which I obviously don't agree with, but I wondered what your thoughts were on kind of why does it matter who's taking the picture and, and how do you feel your identity affects how you shoot? Um, I think that the, um, I'm glad you brought up the idea of objectivity in the image because I've been thinking about that a lot over the past couple of days. And um, I think that this kind of narrative of the photographer as an observer and you know someone who is just there to document what's happening yada 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 mm. um has been a very good tactic to kind of absolve themselves of any moral responsibility um and any sense of humanity and i think it's um something which is deeply rooted in power and control mm. and in um ego because we put with in or evil humanity and um, also, you know, you're separating yourself from this idea that actually you're being invited into someone else's space and you're being invited, you know, so you're being invited into someone else's community, home, even just that moment of crossing on the street, you're, you're stepping into their life by making that photo. And I think you should respect them as a human and as your equal. Um, because so much of documentary photography uh, has been deeply rooted in the very white Western gaze. And I think we should also talk about the history of photography, the role that the camera played in colonization, and that those kind of ways of thinking are deeply embedded in the relationship between the photographer, the camera, and the person on the other side of the camera. 
Completely. And we don't talk enough about the, how much power is rooted in making an image and especially making an image outside of your community. And I think that we just need to talk more about, you know, why are you making images? Why are you there? And I think if you can't explain why you're there or why you're making the work, you know, you should be reconsidering what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that no one should ever make work outside of their immediate experience, because that's ridiculous. But I think that there should just be more thinking behind it. And it should be less knee jerk reactions and actually thinking, okay, I'm going to this place because I want to do something significant. And I want to also facilitate a conversation which lasts beyond a project that is going to win me X award or be good for my portfolio or, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, and, you know, people thinking, you know, you know, okay, do I need to be, you know, why am I going to, I don't know, uh, you know, why am I going to the working class neighborhood in my city mm -hmm. to make work about what's going on? instead of maybe thinking about working class photographers that you know live in your city that might already be documenting what's going on or okay if I am going to do that why am I going to do it is it just for me or is it for actually the people that live there is it for the, the, the community um and that's kind of across the board with so many different things and yeah I just think that the the, the if we really want to live in a better world or in a more equal society you know it starts with how we disseminate images who has the power in the dissemination of images and that comes down to even like the photo editors um and you know well the photo editors the photographers kind of bottom to top whatever way you want to look at it and it be kind of decolonial thought the whole way and across the board um yeah so I think that there's a lot that needs to be done and also it should be taught as a part of someone's photographic education yeah. you know race history with race and photography the history of the camera in relationship to things like eugenics mm -hmm. you know we don't talk about that enough you only learn about it if you research into it or it might be brushed over briefly but these things should be a fundamental part of someone's photographic education to just bring a new generation of much more aware photographers and it's not about people being left or liberal or PC or whatever. It's about people understanding what they're holding and what they're doing. And it's got nothing to do with, you know, yeah, being, however people want to phrase it, yeah, politically correct or being sensitive. Mm. It's just about being human and putting a little bit of humanity back in photography and not surface level humanity, but genuine, you know, community engagement and long lasting kind of, uh, yeah work totally yeah I completely agree and I, I think you know there's so much work to be done on on education across the board and we're going to talk a bit about that with with Nidia and Holly in a bit as you know you're both educators and it'll be good to hear about how you kind of approach education in these respects um just before we move on to that I'm gonna um Nidia let's we kind of touched on one of your projects earlier called The Girls Who Spun Gold, um, which, like I said, is, is one of my favourites. I think when talking about the kind of the female gaze and how it operates, I can't think of a, of a better project than this, um, not simply in terms of, of you as a photographer, but also kind of because the project really began as a, as a process of helping young black women learn to kind of see and understand themselves right um it's the culmination of a girls empowerment group you founded in Ithaca um I wondered if you could just kind of tell us a bit a bit about the concept behind the series and, and what it means to you yes um I guess uh, really quickly, um, it sort of originated, um, I was working at this historically black community center in Ithaca, New York, where I grew up. Um, it's predominantly white college town. And I met a group of girls um, that advocated for a need for space um, to be able to talk about their lives, their experiences. Um, 
And I was luck luckily in the position where I could create that space with them. So I was just finished my undergrad. I had a bunch of exciting things that I had learned that I wanted to share about race and gender and class and sexuality. And then um, they also kind of needed this space. And so we were meeting at this point that was really pivotal, pivotal I think for both of us. Um, and then after a couple years, I had to return to grad school. I wanted to go to grad school and I had to leave them, um, which I felt really guilty about. But I began photographing them as a way to continue to spend time with them after being really busy still with two young kids and also uh, kind of take care or uh, start this photo work that would become my graduate thesis. Um, so I worked on this project for three years with them um, and really turned a lot of our conversations into photographs. So we would have um, conversations and keep journals and talk about bodies. And, uh, and so this project really started as a way to sort of speak back to that process. I work really intuitively. So I just work to make photographs and then kind of um, worked backwards to understand them later. But I, a lot of what it was always running through my mind was creating this space that is very much about them and their own experience, either internally with themselves or with each other. So I was always thinking about this protection of the body, this um, reclaiming um, of the body. Like, is it possible to reclaim your own body and to do that visually? Like, what does that mean? Taking into account the, the male gaze, right? And then also um, like exploring your own body. What does that mean um, too? And how do you do that in photographs with just like without just sexualizing the subject who might be figuring out something sexually with themselves? And is that possible? So that's really where this um, stems from and really thinking about the gaze. How do you negate the gaze? How do you engage and look back um, in terms of the gaze? How do you create a space that is about your your, your own space, your own exploration. Um, and yeah, and I think really too, there was a lot about the, the female body. I think that girls uh, learn about their bodies really differently than boys. Boys learn about their bodies as sort of a rite of passage and learn about their body parts. And, and girls don't. Girls learn that their bodies are really about other people and about pleasing other people. And I really wanted this um, project to explore some of those things. So really um, about starting conversations too and not just like answering um, right. about that. Yeah. Right. And I think you know, your, your relationship with, with the girls in the series is, is such a good example of the way you kind of, <clears throat> you really dedicate yourself to instilling kind of pride in, in young black girls and women, right? Um, which kind of brings us nicely onto the next thing I wanna talk about, which is really the future, um, the future of photography and kind of where the industry is headed. I mean, Nidia and Holly, you're both kind of educators of, of the next generation of women photographers. I'm just going to stop sharing now. How do I stop? I don't have a mouse. Okay, there you go. Oh, wait. Okay. Sorry. Maybe I'll just leave that up. Um, yeah, as kind of educators of, of the next generation of, of women photographers, um, We've kind of, well, I guess gender inequality in photography, it kind of operates as this, this self-perpetuating cycle, right? Where it starts at the level of education and then just becomes continuously exacerbated. Um, I think it was the photographer, Rhiannon Adam, who said a few years ago that, that a lot of women studying photography at university, they're kind of made to feel like their careers are done before they start just because of sort of paternalistic attitudes from kind of tutors and, and peers and stuff um so i like holly starting with you i guess as a kind of an educator of, of fashion photography are you very kind of conscious of the need to to support and galvanize women in particular and how do you kind of do that definitely i feel such a huge responsibility uh, to do that because it's all about like um you know you can't be what you can't see can you so if you're like going back to what we talked about earlier if all you if you want to be a fashion photographer and all you ever see is men who are you know getting the big campaigns and doing the big editorial spreads then of course that's gonna dishearten you and feel like your career is over before mm -hmm. it's even started um 
And yeah, it's just crazy those stats that you were talking about earlier that 80% of photography students are female, but 15% are practicing photographers. That's terrifying. So that's that is definitely something that I try and um help my students with so like mentoring like even sort of on a casual basis like giving my email address to students saying if you have any questions um mm. feel free to reach out to me um and yeah and like educating like the importance of like asking for a fee and pushing back if the client says oh uh, maybe could you just do this for your portfolio um encouraging them to push back on things like that um and then sort of on a wider scale, um, the, like trying to educate students on like representation. So uh, we talked a little bit about the female form uh, earlier. Um, like one of the exercises I do with uh, my students are to like pull out um, a, a photo from a magazine that they have uh, their favorite photo and tell us why they like it. And often they're, and this it's fashion photography that I teach. So these are fashion magazines and a lot of the pictures that they'll pull out are nudes. And I'll say, well, what's fashion about this? Why is this naked photo fashion? Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of, uh, yeah, unlearning that as well. Mm. Mm. Nydia, um, I guess, yeah, I mean, ditto. I kind of, like, you, like I said, you, you've obviously been, for a long time dedicated to, to instilling pride and, and ambition in, in the minds of, of young black girls. And I guess, how do you kind of do this at Spellman and how does the atmosphere at Spellman make you feel about the future? I think Spellman is probably the most magical place that I've ever been. It's black women doing everything, <laughs> um, science, math, art, um, the tech stuff uh I don't it's just it's an amazing um place to be in and I feel honored to be there um it especially um in terms of my subject matter um and who I photograph and so uh, I just find it as just a great honor I think one day I was teaching and I was showing a film and I was just sitting back and I was like oh my gosh I don't think that there's any space that exists like this in the world where um I mean I could be wrong um where this this room full of of, of black women are learning photography in college and so I think it um it makes me feel like a responsibility to like to sort of figure out because I think we're growing our department is growing right we're really small also teaching photography as an art to a school that's very traditional whose parents have gone there and grandparents have gone or grandmothers and you know have gone there and really thinking about how does photography lead to a career how are you going to take care of yourself so I think in the traditional sense photography is not seen as like maybe not something that somebody's parents really want them to do right because it seems kind of scary and how are you going to be able to survive especially as a black woman like um, to have something more solid and so I think um, really starting to think about that too and just sort of how to shape that um, the education right so it's really uh, I do a lot in uh, in terms of um, showing black photographers and black female photographers sometimes I realize I'm like oh my gosh they're just all black women right so then how do I even push myself to expand and be inclusive too of um, everybody or of really su super important projects and bodies of work and photographers so I think it's great responsibility but also super exciting um, and um, just dealing every day with black women who are super empowered to and have this space and and then there's a lot of self portraiture happening, especially during COVID and then there's a lot of like people's families and grandmothers and grandparents are now coming into play in their images so that's exciting too. That's yeah. yeah, I mean like we kind of said earlier, it feels like across the board education needs a lot of work so. Thank God we have women like you. Um, Gia, I guess where Holly and, and Nydia are educating the next generation of women photographers, you kind of are part of the next generation of, of women photographers. I'd be interested to hear kind of how you feel about, about the future of the industry. Because um, I guess like discourse around gender equality and around racial equality has obviously been building massively for a while now, um, obviously heightened a lot in recent months by, by emphasis on anti-racism. And I guess, how deep do you, do you think this goes? Do you worry that it's performative? Um, 
yeah I do think unfortunately it is often quite performative Mm -hmm. um and I think that you know one of the best ways that I think people can kind of put their money where their mouth is when it comes to wanting to open up opportunities to people like myself um is offering places you know I mean I the first portfolio review I ever went to which was outside of my university I got given a um a scholarship place and it was at uh, offspring photo meet um in London and I was given a um a scholarship place to go for free where normally people would pay you know a hundred plus pounds to be there to meet with photo editors you know and you get you know a couple of minutes sit down with them oh. and um you know being able to do that and being on a scholarship place where I would never have been able to afford it I've always worked um jobs whether it's in the nursery hospitality I've always worked you know jobs to support my practice um and offering those opportunities you know then a couple of years down the line I got commissioned by WaterAid by having that scholarship place at the at the thing mm-hmm. at the uh, portfolio review and have you know bit been published you know internationally because of that not obviously just that one meeting but we don't take into account enough the cost of being a photographer and the cost of starting up as a photographer and even things like going to portfolio reviews visiting photo festivals networking you know I if I could it's really difficult to explain to people like you know you've got okay from a British perspective I'm now based in the Netherlands but if you were to look at like say the the documentary photography or the photo calendar and you've got you know parry photo in you know november you've got all um in the south of france you've got um oh no kia cost money but then you know you get people that can go to them they can network and they can get those opportunities Mm. because they've got a disposable income mm-hmm. hello they have the money um so i think that if people want yeah i don't want to interrupt there you. i'm so sorry you cut out for a fair bit of that Oh, where did you lose me? <laughs> um, you were kind of talking, well, yeah, just about about how expensive it is is to be in the industry. Yeah. And actually, one of the questions that someone has sent in is: is sexism and capitalism interrelated? Definitely. I guess what I say is that is that you know racism, sexism, and, and capitalism yeah. all have to be critiqued at the same time, yeah, uh, because they all operate intersectionally, right? Definitely, I think we need to. Um, if we want to encourage real diversity and inclusivity within the industry, especially now where people of my age live in such a war, everyone is such a precarious financial situation. A lot of people, um, yeah, we've got to give people opportunities, pay for people to be in places and um, yeah, you know, really dig deep into our pockets. Mm -hmm. Totally. we're nearly going to run out of time. I might just, we have a couple more questions that I'm going to ask you guys. Um, so we kind of drew on on sexism and capitalism. Another question we had was, is the female gaze less sexual than the male gaze? Who, <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> Holly, what about you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't uh, I think the female gaze has been given enough of a stage to explore that um, completely. Uh, I don't I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm interested to hear what Nidia and Gia think. Nidia, do you know? No, no. Um, I, want <laughs> say, I want to say no. Like my gut is to say no, it's not. Um, I think that internalized male gaze um, definitely comes into play. And then I think the gaze of women looking at other women also becomes sometimes like about uh, 
like competition. I just think because we've adopted that milk or because we're feel like we're in competition with each other to be skinnier or have a bigger butt or longer hair, like all these like different things that come into play, but that's also uh, adopting that male gaze and a whole bunch of other male centered stuff. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Gia, are you sure? No. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm old. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, it's it's really, it's, a, I think it's again a lot about a lot of internalized mm -hmm. um, misogyny and a lot of in, you know, things that are embedded in us. And I think all it takes is to be constantly questioning yourself as a practitioner and kind of doing your best, I guess, um, and listening. Oh, sorry, Gia, you've gone again. Um, one, we had one more question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Gia, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You just, we lost you again. You didn't, the internet's terrible, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have one more question for Holly. Um, I'm an MA fashion photography student at LCF. The stats are quite terrifying. What do you think or s could suggest that female photographers do to really break down that barrier? Okay, so um, I give a, a talk um, at Central St. Martin's about uh, how to break into fashion photography, uh, which has sort of like about eight of my hot takes. <laughs> but I think the most important one is to never give up because um, there's a lot of rejection in the industry and um, like I mean a lot uh, and you know even now 12 years in I get rejections like every day and um, so you just need to like you know if you're going to be upset about that take your time but then dust yourself off and go again and um, I emailed a uh, company magazine which um, is no longer in print now but it was a big Hearst title at the time uh, I emailed them for two years <laughs> before anyone got back to me and then one day suddenly they just replied to my email and I started working with them then uh, that week uh, for the next few years um, and from that then once I started doing that I said oh I th I'm shooting for this title now and then that led to loads of other opportunities so I think not giving up is the key thing and knowing that rejection is sort of part and parcel of the process um, another one um, is and this is more of a like a practical tip than a philosophical <laughs> tip uh, is to have an elevator pitch and um, so like if you and, and networking that's another one that's really important. But if you're going to a networking event on your own, uh, that can be really intimidating. Um, but uh, if you have an elevator pitch, then you have something to say uh, to people who you really want to meet. If there was like an editor that you really wanted to meet, if you can introduce yourself uh, and say, uh, uh, say a little bit about your work and uh, what you want to be doing in your career then and it can just be like two sentences long and it can change as your sort of career journey changes as well but having that then you've got a reason to speak to people and it's inviting more questions as well um so i think spending a little bit of time working on an elevator pitch is important and then having a business card as well that's another practical tip that sometimes gets overlooked because then you have a really quick way of exchanging contact details and i know everyone sort of connects on instagram and things these days but i do think you can get a business card with one of your photos on it. I have so many like editors and clients who have emailed me saying, oh, I just saw your business card on my desk. I really liked the picture. Um, can we like mm. or whatever? That's a really good um, idea. Yeah, um, a couple of little tips. One last question. We have um, someone in their final year studying photography, exploring the male gaze. Um, they're worried about the ability to work and get work uh, because of COVID. Do you have any advice? Nidia, let's go with you. During COVID, I don't know. I feel like I've been lucky. Well, it's just been interesting uh, after everything sort of happened um, to sort of get job. I think because I've switched areas too and um, uh, that's been helpful. I don't know. Okay. You don't know, that's okay. Yeah. Like sometimes things just come to me and then I'm really thankful. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, well, how have you found kind of working, making work since mm -hmm. the pandemic? I mean, I've just, qu I quit my job, my money-making job that was um, 
uh, before I relocated. Um, and that was scary. But I think that um, you kind of you kind of just got to wing it. I mean, I think just just emailing people, um, being persistent. One thing that I realized when I was still at uni was that I was getting a lot of opportunities because I just was being ballsy, basically, and just emailing people and saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. Um, you know, make sure you've got a website, even if it's a bit rudimental. And just saying to people, you know, and 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 going off what they've already done, you know, look, you know, research people really well, find their email address, and just send them a very nice, polite email. And sometimes people will, might not get back to you. Sometimes you've got to follow up. They might bank you, bank you somewhere in a file, and then get back to you. But um, I've just that's kind of how I've done it so far, just through, you know, trying to just put myself out there unfortunately the industry is so saturated especially the younger you are I think the more like every year it's more and more and more people um and just yeah just trying to cut through a little bit and and it won't happen also you know there's no shame in having another job um I think that's really important do people yeah I, enough? I have, sorry I just people don't talk about that enough that, that no. you're still an artist right. if you if you also do something else to make money right exactly like I, I up until the end of um August I was working oh end of July I'd been working on an in a children's nursery on and off since I was like 18 um I've also mm. worked in you know restaurants retail mm. like and we just we we I actually once had someone say to me that I hadn't made it because I was still working a second job and um it's 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 bullshit you know I mean you yeah, need to that's, pay rent. <laughs> that's the thing and then it just perpetuates the idea that the only people that can do this are the people that can afford to do it whilst not actually making real wages exactly. and that's how you end up with a load of like privileged white dudes taking over the whole industry right um Okay, I, that's the last question I'm going to ask. Um, we have gone a little bit over, so I guess I'm going to wrap that up now. Um, I feel like I have loads more I want to talk about. <laughs> um, no, this has been so good. Thank you so much um, to the audience and to you ladies for, for joining me to kick off Belfast Photo Festival. Um, the good news is there's a whole kind of another month of, of virtual events going on. Um, for everyone watching the, the next one, the next uh live talk will be on saturday 7th of november um and that one's called landscapes challenging convention um i think it's at 6 p.m but double check <laughs> um thank you so much everyone again um i've loved this really appreciate it um and yeah have great weeks <laughs> see ya bye, bye everyone bye.